Good afternoon. Welcome. Bienvenidos y bienvenidas. My name is Barbara Fry, and I'm the director of the Human Rights Program at the University of Minnesota. And I'm the principal investigator for this project on press reporting and disappearances in Mexico. We are so pleased that you have joined us for the launch of this website and database of our project. Before we begin the program, let me review a few housekeeping rules. First, the interpreting function. This program is fully interpreted in Spanish. We thank Nadia Smith and Anna Veblen for their professional interpretation today. For those of you using Windows or Mac operating systems, select the little icon of the world on your, your bottom screen. And for those of you using Android or iOS today, tap the ellipsis icon, the dot, 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 and then language interpretation. Select the language you want to hear. An optional feature is to hear the translation only. Select the mute original audio button. Some other housekeeping rules. This webinar is being recorded. And we would like you for the Q&A function to send your questions through the Q&A uh, Q uh, portal and we will keep track of those questions. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time during the presentations and we'll turn to the audience questions at the end of our, of our program. You can choose to submit anonymously if you don't want your name to be mentioned. Also, we've left open the chat function for everyone to use if you would like to engage among attendees or with the presenters. We won't always have our eyes on the chat, but we're happy to get your reactions and thoughts as we're presenting. So uh, let me move now to our project with the housekeeping rules done. As you know, coming to this event, there is a crisis of disappearances in Mexico. By the government's own accounting, there have been more than 86,000 disappearances in Mexico to date. The majority of these cases have occurred since 2006, when the Mexican government declared its war on drugs and sent in military troops to address the increasing power of organized crime in the country. These efforts only made the situation worse. And indeed, many state forces actually joined with the cartels in a web of macro criminality that drove violence in every sector of Mexican society. Enforced disappearance is one of the most universally condemned human rights crimes. It is a continuing violation, not only of the human rights of the victim, but of their loved ones who suffer grave harm because they do not know what happened. Because the evidence of the crime disappears with the victim, there is also a serious lack of public information about disappearances, which of course favors the perpetrators. With the aim of learning more about disappearances and addressing that lack of information, in 2015, a collective of three research partners, Professor Karina Ansolabeere of Flaxo, Mexico, and Lee Payne of Oxford University and myself established the Observatory on Disappearances and Impunity in Mexico for the purpose of applying academic methods to analyze available sources of information. We divided up the work among ourselves and our partners in Mexico analyzed the files of organizations 
and court proceedings on site in the country. Meanwhile, our team at the University of Minnesota, working from a distance, used online media stories as our source of information. Since we started this project in 2017, the press part of the project, more than 40 student researchers have participated by reading and coding news articles, analyzing the results for patterns, interviewing journalists, family members of the disappeared and other human rights advocates. The resulting database is now on our website and we hope that it will help readers to understand the phenomenon of disappearances in Mexico, to learn more about victims and about those who search for them, and to understand how the press has chosen to report about this crisis as it unfolds. So in the chat, you have links to the website. I hope you will go yourself, but I'll share the screen for a minute and uh, take you to that website. This is on the uh, website of the human rights program at the University of Minnesota, and therefore it had to um, align with all of the design elements and thus it looks very University of Minnesota E. Um, the home page gives you a little background and then you there are eight different sub sections. The first box is, uh, if you click on it, is in disappearances in Mexico, which gives you background on the issue, on the international law, and um, how the press is responding to that overall. The second box is our findings, our findings both um, uh, descriptive of uh, what we learn from the press accounts and um, our findings about how the press actually reported on disappearances, what cases were considered more newsworthy, and uh, what, um, what kinds of um, decisions did editors and journalists make. The third box explains the methodology and um, the conceptual framework we've used in our research. Boxes four, five, six, and seven are specific in-depth looks at the four states that we analyzed, the states of Coahuila, Nuevo Leon, Jalisco, and Guerrero. And then we have our, our references and acknowledgments in the final box. So, the, one of the great features about this is that our database, the full database is accessible as an Excel spreadsheet on the site in box three. And um, that also has a coding manual, both in English and Spanish, which explain how we chose to code each aspect of these news articles. So we hope that human rights teachers and students will want to not only look at this information, but to consider working on the press articles on another state in Mexico using the same methodology. Here is a brief sketch of our findings, which will be elaborated further by members of the team. There are three findings I'd like to point out to you. The first is using a descriptive analysis based on the model of who did what to whom and what was the response of the state. That's a framework developed by Patrick Ball in a human rights researcher in 1996, and that is used in the Herodox network of human rights documentation. So who did what to whom and what was the response of the state? These will be described in detail by Yolanda Burkhart, but let me just point out that the main findings are that disappearances are crimes that target youth, that state and non-state actors work together to carry out enforced disappearances, 
and that there is little state action that investigates or prosecutes these crimes. Indeed, there is almost total impunity um, as reflected in the press reports. The second finding, in addition to this descriptive analysis, is um, starts from the recognition that the media plays an important role in how the public understands human rights violations. And it also plays a role in promoting justice, institutional reform, and reparations. These findings will be more detailed by Maria Ignacia Terra in this presentation, but let me highlight a few here. The most apparent thing reflected in the database is that few cases receive coverage. As I mentioned, there are more than 86,000 disappearances in Mexico in the past 15 years. So not surprisingly, the journalists can't cover them all. There's also an atmosphere of grave danger to journalists, one of the most dangerous countries for journalists. So we, we want to emphasize that the lack of coverage of individual cases is not just unique to Mexico. In other contexts of normalized violence, such as gun violence in urban neighborhoods in the United States, we see the same lack of reporting about the victims, who they were, the perpetrators, and the state responses to the crimes. So it's not unique or unsurprising, but there was very little press reporting in relation to the amount of disappearances. We did, um, then we consider, uh, uh, oh, <laughs> thus we consider this information to be just one piece of information that the observatory has covered. So we also analyzed um, which disappearance cases in light of the fact that so few received coverage, which ones did receive coverage and why? And so we looked at um, uh, an area of uh, academic research called newsworthiness. And we looked at newsworthiness in the context of Mexico where we have widespread violations. So which cases get covered and why? And we found that cases that are rare or unusual in size or seriousness receive more coverage. We also found that cases with ideal victims who were vulnerable or high profile received more coverage. And finally, uh, an important finding was that families and in, in cases where families and civil society organizations pressed for answers and refused to give up on their, on their families' disappearance cases, they also received more coverage. And we were pleased to confirm this finding so that we could demonstrate the relative effectiveness of these family efforts. So let me give you a, a roadmap for today's presentation. Um, we're going to first hear from Hunter Johnson about who reports on disappearances. Then we will hear, or we will also hear from two of our fabulous undergraduates, Rosa Joyce and Maria Larson, who will talk about who are the victims. Maria Ignacia Terra will discuss how we did this research and she will also review um, what story the press tells about disappearances and why. And Yolanda Burkhardt, we'll talk about who did what to whom and what was the state response. I just wanna thank each of these team members who did such fantastic work. They've been working for a year on this project and some like Hunter and Maria Ignacia have worked on this project for several years, well beyond their graduation from the Masters of Human Rights program at the University of Minnesota. I also want to acknowledge two members of our team who won't be presenting, Victor Florence and AJ Kramer, um, who uh, do behind the scenes work. Um, 
And finally, last but not least, our funders, uh, the Human Rights Initiative of the University of Minnesota, Fulbright Comexis, which funded my study in Mexico, and the Oenacean Endowment Fund for Justice and Peace Studies, which is a fund of the Minneapolis Foundation. We're grateful to all of them. So thank you again for joining us. And now I will turn it over to Hunter Johnson, a member of the research team and a documentary filmmaker. Thank you, Barb. Uh, I'm Hunter Johnson. And as mentioned, I'm a member of the re research team uh, at the observatory. And I'm also a filmmaker. As a creative component of the observatory, I've documented the work of Dalia Sosa and Darwin Franco, independent journalists with Zona Docs who report on disappearances every day in Guadalajara. Their in-depth reporting echoes the voices of thousands of families who are searching for their missing loved ones and details how the government has repeatedly failed to help them in, in this endeavor. Despite the tragic stories they investigate every day, Darwin and Dahlia ultimately see journalism as an instrument of peace, a way of communicating hope and preserving memory. We will now show a two minute video where they explain their journalistic approach and why it is so important to report on disappearances. El compromiso que tenemos los periodistas no es solo decir que hay desaparecidos, sino hacer entender por qué hay desaparecidos. Tratar de entender cuál es el contexto que incide para que una desaparición eh, se genere. El periodismo en sí mismo, bueno, eh, implica una responsabilidad social. Yo creo que tenemos que visibilizar la lucha que están haciendo las familias, una lucha por encontrar la justicia por encontrar la verdad, por encontrar a sus seres queridos desaparecidos. A nivel político, social o incluso periodístico, pensamos que la desaparición solo es una condición. Ah, está desaparecido, ¿no? Eh, y eso es una expresión que le quita, digamos, eh, la parte brutal del asunto. Es decir, eh, en México nadie desaparece, ¿no? A México, en México las personas las desaparecen tratando de entender eh, uno dónde desaparece la persona, qué hacía la persona, eh, en el lugar donde esta persona desapareció, qué ha ocurrido, quién le sirve un desaparecido. Nosotros creemos que no es que uno llegue y ponga el micrófono y que de inmediato uno les dé voz. Ellos tienen pues voz propia y son quienes están visibilizando las situaciones que viven. ¿Cuál, cuál será la diferencia entre un activista periodista y yo creo que no hay gran diferencia. Un defensor de los derechos humanos busca señalar, visibilizar las condiciones que vulneran los, los derechos humanos de otras personas y eso es justo lo que hacemos como periodista. Seguramente algunos colegas eh, serán críticos a esto ¿no? y dirán que bueno pues uno tiene que ser también ese contrapeso y uno tiene que mantenerse quizá un tanto objetivo. Yo creo que sí, sí, pero no te quita en absoluto decir lo que está pasando. generar un trabajo que incide y que le ayude primero bueno, a las familias en su exigencia de justicia y búsqueda, pero también que le permita a las personas sensibilizarse y saber que eso ocurre y que los desaparecidos nos faltan a todos. To learn more about Darwin and Dahlia's work reporting on disappearances, I invite you all to attend the observatory's next event on Tuesday evening, where we will screen the full 30-minute documentary entitled, Until We Find Them. It will be followed by a panel discussion, including the film subjects and myself, the filmmaker. And now I'll turn it over to Rosa Joyce, a member of our student research team, who will present a story map detailing one particular disappearance case. Thanks, Hunter. 
My name is Rosa, and I've been an intern with the observatory for a little over a year. Now I would like to tell you a little bit about our rationale for creating and including story maps, a type of digital narrative, on our website. The story maps were created to complement the findings in the database. Given that the observatory's findings are based on figures that highlight patterns of reporting on disappearances, we want to make an effort to ensure that this subject is not abstract or detached from the lived experiences of disappearances in Mexico. We never want our audience to lose sight of the fact that every data point in our database represents a person with unique life story, personality, and loved ones who are waiting for them to be found. To provide insight into this reality, we decided to highlight two cases that received an exceptional amount of press coverage. We chose to feature two well-known cases because their existing visibility minimizes the security threat compared to featuring the lesser known cases that are also in our database. The story maps provide an overview of both cases and can be found under the faces of the disappeared in the disappearances in Mexico section of the website. Before presenting the stories, we would like to express a sincere thank you to all the families and NGOs for their collaboration in this project and the invaluable work that they do to raise the visibility of these cases. And now I will share Israel's story with you. In 2011, Israel Arenas Duran was living in Juarez, a municipality of Nuevo León. Israel spent his time working at a plant nursery with his dad to try to help his family get ahead. He was 17. After work one day, Israel went out to a bar with a few of his coworkers. While at the bar, Israel's phone rang. It was his younger brother, Daniel, calling to tell him to come home for dinner. Israel then asked Daniel to come to the bar and bring 170 pesos to make up for the difference for the bill they owed for the drinks. Daniel arrived at a scene of chaos. The bar manager had called the transit police, claiming that Israel and his friends had not yet paid their tab in full. And by the time Daniel arrived, the transit police had already handed over Israel's friends to the Zetas a violent organized crime group. And they were leading a handcuffed Israel into an unmarked truck. The transit police claimed that Israel had dented their car when he tried to escape and warned Daniel to leave the area. Fearing for his own life, Daniel rushed home to alert his mother, Luz Maria Duran Mota, on what had happened. At the transit police station, Israel's family were stonewalled by the officials who claimed that Israel was not there, then later claiming that he was, but that the family couldn't see him because they had slapped him around to teach him a lesson and to come back the next morning. When the family returned, they were further obstructed by the transit police who refused to talk to the family or even confirm that Israel was in their custody they never saw Israel again. From that day on, the Israel, the Arenas Duran family has actively investigated Israel's disappearance. Faced by the indifference and potential involvement of the police in the disappearance of their son, Israel's parents reported his disappearance to the State Council on Human Rights. Israel's parents also sought support from the NGO Kadak. In 2013, the investigation Israel's parents opened led to the prosecution and conviction of two people for their involvement in Israel's disappearance. Importantly, due to the recommendation of the State Commission on Human Rights, the Juarez authorities had to accept the responsibility of their officers and issued a public apology to the family. Through this case, Juarez became the first municipality in Nuevo León 
to acknowledge the participation of their own transit police in a case of enforced disappearance. The fact that there were convictions at all in this case, an unfortunately rare outcome in the state, reflects the unrelenting efforts of Israel's parents as well as their advocates. Almost two years after Israel's disappearance, the mayor at the time extended a public apology to the Arenas Turan family. Such gestures from the state are actually quite rare. Most governments never provide any acknowledgement of wrongdoing to the families of the disappeared. It has been 3,597 days since the last time Israel Durena Arenas Duran was last seen. His whereabouts are still unknown. Like the majority of families of those who have been forcibly disappeared, the Arenas Duran family are still burdened by unanswered questions of what happened to their loved one. Sadly, his father passed away in a car accident earlier this year. Even though he never lived to see his son's safe return, the search for Israel continues. Now I'll turn it over to Maria Terra, our project manager, for an introduction to the database we've created. Hello all. My name is Maria Terra. I'm a Masters of Human Rights graduate, and I have been working in this project since its very beginnings, back in 2016. I actually began as a coder, and now here we are, in the culmination of all these years of work. So thank you all for being here. Well, as an introduction to our database, I want to explain the methodology we used to find and code Mexican press articles about disappearances. Students at the University of Minnesota coded online articles from Mexican news outlets from 2009 to mid 2018 in four different states, Coahuila, Guerrero, Jalisco, and Nuevo Leon. We located the articles by searching digital databases like Pactiva, Newsbank, and Google. Whenever we found a named victim in the reports, we then searched again for all articles in which the victim's name was mentioned. Then each student coded these articles using a Google survey that captured multiple information about the case. This coding instrument includes 226 variables related to five main categories of information, which are summarized in the table showing the screen. In the website, you will find the entire database by state and aggregated in a Microsoft Excel document, which you can download. As you can see in this slide, that's how the database looks. It looks a bit messy, but we just wanted to show you how it actually looks. And it is important to note that for reasons of security and to not increase the risk of the victims, their relatives, or the journalists, no full names are published, only first names or initials. The only full names used in the database are those of perpetrators or state agents related to the case, except when they're victims. So in this next slide, we want to show you how to use the database and the coding manual. So in this case, we have the variable of occupation of the victim and it has numbers, which are the codes. So if you go to the middle and you find number seven, then you would go to the coding manual to the question uh, of the occupation of the victim and you would find number seven and see that it's uh, categorizes the occupation of the victim as crafts, craft and related trade workers. So that's what the occupation of the victim would be in this particular case of disappearance. Well, next we'll hear from Yolanda Burkhardt, graduate student researcher in our team, 
to discuss the basic facts and the descriptive findings of the research. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Maria, for the introduction. As she mentioned, my name is Yolanda. I am a second year Masters of Human Rights student, and I've been working on this project for about a year, uh, primarily doing the data analysis. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, as a brief overview of the database, um, as others have said, we study disappearances between 2009 to mid 2018 in the four states here on the screen, um, in the two border straight states of Coahuila and Nuevo León and south central states of Jalisco and Guerrero. And using the methodology process that Maria described, we identified 651 victims um, by analyzing press reports from 227 media outlets. So in terms of geography or geographic distribution, um, disappearances tended to be reported more often in city centers. Listed on the screen are the top five municipalities. But as you also note, um, by looking at, for example, Piedras Negras, which is the top municipality, um, listed here, it's only by 10%, so 44 cases in the database. So it was by a, a relatively small margin. Um, the press report suggests that disappearances were widespread and deconcentrated among the municipalities in each state. And as we'll talk in the next couple of slides, something that we noticed in the four states is that um, the nature of disappearances was slightly different in terms of there's some patterns of similarity between Coahuila and Nuevo León um, versus Jalisco and Guerrero. So this graph maps out over time press reports about disappearances in the four states. The orange line on the top represents the total number of disappearances. Um, you can see the peak in 2010, and then it declines into 2014, and then climbs again towards 2018. The other lines below it are each individual state with distinct trends over time. I wanted to call folks' attention to uh, Coahuila and Nuevo León, um, the red line and the blue line, and you can see that there's a peak at the beginning of our time frame in the mid or the 2009 to 2011 and then it fluctuates but decreases generally over the rest of the time period while Guerrero and Jalisco on the other hand start out fairly low in terms of press reports and then climb towards the later period of our study. <clears throat> so in terms of what was reported about the victims Coverage of victims and cases varied widely. There were some cases that received a single press article and other cases that received up to 23 uh, press articles. And so what we found was that the details or details about the case varied. Um, and that, and so to give you an idea, 20, 5% or a quarter of all the cases in our database only received one article. So um, by and large, we saw that there was not a lot of information available to the public on these cases. Consistently, the press re uh, reported on three pieces of demographic information about the victims, gender, age, and occupation. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in the next couple of slides. Over half of the victims in our database um, disappeared alone, or were disappeared alone, um, and 44% were disappeared in a group, which means that numerous people were disappeared at once in one event. The other piece of information that we found in the press articles was information about the where the victim was disappeared from. 41% of cases, the victim was disappeared from a place related to them. So that could be work or home 
or school or a property they owned uh, or something. And then 33% were disappeared from a route or means of transportation. What I also wanted to talk about here is what information wasn't reported. Um, we didn't find next very little to no information about education, um, race, socioeconomic background, nationality, um, whether or not the victim belonged to an indigenous group or whether or not they were a migrant in Mexico. Um, and this is important because we know that migrants specifically and indigenous peoples are targeted with disappearances, but that's not something that we found represented in the press coverage. In terms of gender and occupation, um, the victims were predominantly male, which is consistent with other research about disappearances in Mexico. 74% were male, 25% were female. The press identified five cases in which uh, the victim was transgender. We know that violence against transgender people is in, un, highly unreported and so we are assuming that this is likely a vast underrepresentation of trans victims um, who were disappeared. In terms of top five occupations reported, by and large service and sales workers was the largest group. 30% uh, um, of our victims when an occupation was listed were service and sales workers with nearly 100 cases shortly or followed was professionals. And this includes lawyers, doctors, engineers, um, then students, plant machine operators, and then armed forces. And armed forces includes police officers and military. There are two distinctions or two different trends with the states that I wanted to call out. The first is that Jalisco, um, Professionals was the top category of victims who were disappeared in, in Jalisco, which was different than any other state. Every, all the other states were service and sales workers. And the second is that Nuevo Leon had a higher representation of armed forces, uh, members of the armed forces who were victims. It was actually the second highest occupation in Nuevo Leon. Um, and 20 of the 31 cases in our database were in Nuevo Leon. And, one thing that we found that accounts for that is that um, there was a high profile case of 11 police officers that were disappeared in Nuevo Leon. So that is that contributes to that number. So this is a population chart um, with age and gender. Uh, the, I, the charts are identical, but one is in Spanish and one is English to facilitate easier reading. Um, we, so we found by analyzing the press articles um, that the victims were young, they were very young. So a third of all the victims were between 18 and 25. And with this chart, you can see that by gender breakdown, the, there's a noticeable difference between the male and, and female victims. Uh, the blue is male, the green is female. Um, and so, the highest age group of disappearances among women and girls was between 10 and 17. And nearly 40% of women and girls who were disappeared were in that range. Um, the press tended to cover group cases at higher rate than individual cases. This chart lays out how many a range of articles published. So we can see that in this case, the blue is group cases and the green is individual cases. Um, in the first part of the graph, you can see that individual cases were more likely to receive one to three articles about the case at a much higher rate. Um, and on the other end of the chart, group cases were more likely to receive 16 or more cases published um, or articles published about the case. And Maria will talk a little bit more about this in the next section. So um, according to the press articles, the vast majority of cases remain unresolved. 
uh, as seen as yellow in yellow, we, for the purpose of this study, um, grouped articles or yeah, articles where the press um, stated that the victim was remains disappeared and cases where there was no follow up. So um, there was no further information or no outcome disclosed. And we grouped those together because in the eyes of the public, there was no resolution, right? So um, the case remains open. There's the person wasn't found. Uh, and so you can see that by and large, most cases, um, the victim remains disappeared or there's no information available. Uh, there's some differences within the states. You can see that uh, Nuevo Leon and Guerrero have slightly higher rates of reporting outcomes, um, whether or not the victim was deceased or found alive. Um, and in Guerrero, 31% of the victims who are disappeared are found deceased. So in terms of what was reported about the perpetrators, 41% of suspect, 41% uh, of cases, the press does report one or more suspected perpetrators. And the level of detail um, varied. There are times where a specific group is mentioned, like a specific cartel or a government department. Uh, in other cases, unspecific individuals are named. So this could be like a kidnapper who like is not necessarily affiliated with a certain group um, or unidentified state actors or generally someone who uh, has known participation in a cartel, but the name of the cartel is not uh, listed. So I wanted to just reiterate here uh, what Barb mentioned earlier, which is that journalists face immense danger in reporting about disappearances and particularly about perpetrator information. And so we know that um, oftentimes or sometimes the press outlet or the press organization or journalists will make the call not to report information about a specific perpetrator for fear of their physical safety. Um, and that is part of the nature of disappearances. In the next couple of slides, I'm going to talk about perpetrators in the first one we're going to talk about in three categories. And then the next one we're going to talk about specific groups that were named. Um, in this one, we're looking at state actors versus private actors, and then when they were working together. And I wanted to emphasize that private actors here includes any cartel involvement. Um, we hesitated to use the phrase like criminal actor or criminal organization because anyone who's participating in a disappearance is, is, partic is criminal, right? And so um, we chose to use private actor, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And so something that we found was that there is collusion. Well, we knew, we knew this, right? But the press is reporting about collusion between state and private actors. And here you can see that um, Guerrero and Jalisco have lower numbers of reporting perpetrators um, or specific suspected perpetrators, while Coahuila and Nuevo León have slightly higher rates. Um, and in Nuevo León and Coahuila, you can also see that the numbers of collusion between state and private actors is higher, um, and specifically private actor involvement is higher in Nuevo León. In terms of the specific perpetrators that were named, um, it varied by the state. So Coahuila and Nuevo León, the press reported that Los Zetas committed the most disappearances, followed very closely by state and municipal police. And in act, actually, the press reported quite a few cases in which Los Zetas uh, were working in collaboration with state and municipal police. In Jalisco, Cartel de Nueva Generación was reported most frequently, and in Guerrero, the press rarely named a specific perpetrator. So finally, um, when we were looking at what was reported about the state's response, um, we found very little to be for, as the truth. Um, in 71% of cases, there was no mention of an official search that was conducted by the state for the victim. 
Um, in 89% of cases, there was no court case initiated. In 92%, there was no mention of a sentencing process or delivery of a sentence. And so overwhelmingly, what we found by analyzing the press, uh, the press articles was that there's incredible impunity for disappearances. And so with that, that concludes my section. Um, and I'm going to turn it back over to Maria to talk about the conceptual findings. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Yolanda. Well, in addition to the descriptive findings presented by Yolanda, we found two key findings in our study regarding the nature of these press reports and disappearances. The first one is about spot news reporting. We basically found a tendency of the press to report on each disappearance as a single criminal event and not as an ongoing human rights violation. This tendency to use spot news, also called Notas del Dia or Nota Roja, which is basically a crime note, as well as the large number of cases that receive no coverage at all, limits the public's access to information about disappearances that might lead, might lead to human rights change. As we can see in this next slide, this would be a good example of a nota roja or crime note. In the title, it says breves policiacas or brief police notes. This short paragraph is basically listing the disappearance of three different individuals with no reported connection to each other, nor more information besides the location and date of each disappearance. In this next slide, this is the same note, but showing what's below the section on the disappearances. As you can see, the same story about the disappearances is published with these two other pieces of news about a robbery and a car crash, all in the same press article. So you can see how this format reduces the cases of disappearances to mere crimes. A second conceptual finding from our study has to do with newsworthiness. Our findings extend their very theory of newsworthiness, which asserts that victims who are ideal, females, children, and or the elderly, stories that are unusual or stories that involve more than one victim are considered newsworthy. Another finding related to newsworthiness is that we also found that families and civil society who advocate for disappeared persons increase the newsworthiness of their cases, as I will explain later. To analyze which cases included in our database were most newsworthy, we conducted a content analysis on the top five reported events with the highest number of press articles. First, we have unusual events. The reverie theory argues that newsworthiness is determined by the unusualness of a crime, typified by the involvement of more than one victim. So in terms of unusualness, we actually found that group disappearances received higher media attention overall, with an average of seven articles per group disappearance and four articles per individual disappearance. In this next slide, we see one example of a group disappearance, which corresponds to the case of the 11 police officers disappeared in Apodaca, Nuevo Leon in 2011, which received a lot of attention from the press. It generated at least 14 different news articles, which is double than the average of articles per group case. The coverage was also very thorough, including detailed information about the state's response, investigations and trials, and the location of their bodies in 2016. Another type of unusual events have to do with the degree of seriousness. For example, cases which involve gruesome crimes, 
such as the disappearance and murder of Azucena, Luis, and their baby in Guerrero in January 2018. Azucena was decapitated. Luis was, Luis was murdered and his body was burned, and the baby was found alive in the car inside a cooler. This case generated 15 articles, which is more than double the average of articles per group case. Another set of cases that received a high number of articles and whose newsworthiness is explained by their rarity theory corresponds to the notion of ideal victims that we identified as being high profile or sympathetic persons. One example is the case of Ramferi Hernandez, a high profile former PRD or PRD politician and a social justice activist who disappeared along with his family in Guerrero in October, 2017. They were eventually found dead and the bodies, their bodies were burned. This case generated 11 press articles, which is six more than the average. Other trends concerning sympathetic victims came up in our analysis of the most covered cases. The academic literature explains that victims who are seen as blameless receive more media attention with a wider scope and a more thorough coverage. For example, the disappearance of Joan Gael, the three-year-old boy who disappeared in Coahuila in October, 2015. The coverage was high, given that disappearances of children this young are rare. It also received attention from authorities in Coahuila, evidenced by official searches and the activation of a number alert. This case generated 16 articles which is 11 more articles than the average of reports per case. Another example of victims that are considered vulnerable by the literature and worthiness are female victims, since they're considered more worthy of coverage than males. One example is the case of Daniela Magaña, who disappeared in September, 2014 in Jalisco. Daniela's case generated sympathy with the public since she was a female minor, she was 17 years old, and a University of Guadalajara high school student. This case generated 14 articles, which is nine more than the average of articles per case. Finally, we found that the most highly reported cases demonstrated that families and civil society who spoke out tended to increase the newsworthiness of the case as well. Their actions led to more press coverage, humanized the public profile of the disappeared person, and in some cases resulted in more accountability by state officials. For instance, the disappearance of Juan Hernandez in February 2011 in Nuevo León was covered as in twice as many articles as another federal police officer, even though they disappeared together. They were both disappeared in the same incident, but the outspoken advocacy of Juan Hernandez's mother led to more coverage. The mother was interviewed in almost every article. We believe this to be an important and positive finding in the effort against disappearances. And we hope that it might prov provide encouragement to the families and civil society who fight every day for the disappeared loved ones. Next, we'll hear from Maria Larson, a student researcher on the team. Thanks, Maria. Like Maria said, my name is also Maria, and I've been working with this team for the past year. Like Rosa, I wrote a story map about one of the most highly covered disappearance cases in the four states that we looked at. The disappearance that I researched took place in Coahuila. Jose Antonio Robledo Fernandez 
better known as Tonio among his friends and family, was a civil engineer, a son, brother, friend, partner, and fan of the song Fields of Gold by Sting. In 2009, Tonio was forcibly disappeared from Coahuila, Mexico. This January marked the 12th anniversary of his disappearance. It marked 12 years of uncertainty, of searching, of despair for his dedicated parents, Maria Guadalupe and Jose Antonio, who have never stopped demanding justice for their son. After studying civil engineering in Mexico City, Tonio accepted a job with a construction company in Monclova, Coahuila. This was two years before his disappearance. In 2009, on his way back to Coahuila from Monterrey, Tonio was approached in his car by a group of men who peppered him with questions. Who are you? What are you doing here? At this time, Tonio was on the phone with his girlfriend, Isabel, who listened in horror as she heard Tonio being beaten and abducted by these men. Deeply upset, Isabel rushed to Tonio's construction site to report his kidnapping. Tonio's manager did not seem to be upset when he heard the news of Tonio's disappearance and even warned Isabel not to tell Tonio's parents about what had happened. Despite these instructions, Isabel told Maria and Jose about Tonio's beating and kidnapping. Maria and Jose rushed to Coahuila and began what would become 12 years of tireless searching and advocacy for their son. Maria and Jose report, reported Tonio's disappearance to state authorities and gave police officers valuable information on their son. However, this information was later passed along to members of Los Zetas, one of the most violent cartels in Mexico. Shortly after Tonio's disappearance, his parents were contacted by his company security guard who claimed to have information on Tonio. Desperate for this information, Tonio's parents agreed to meet with a security guard in the hotel where they were staying. Instead of meeting with the security guard, however, Jose and Maria were met with two men who represented Los Zetas. On this night, Jose and Maria came to understand the organized nature of Tonio's disappearance. After exhausting all avenues of action in Coahuila, Tonio's parents returned to Mexico City. They did not, however, give up the fight to find Tonio and return to Coahuila every 10 days for the next three months to continue their search. Jose and Maria also reported Tonio's disappearance to the National Attorney General and sought support from the group Fuerzas Unidas por Nuestros Desaparecidos, or FUNDEC. Maria and Jose's efforts led to legal proceedings, which, as has been mentioned, are rare in, the, in cases of enforced disappearances in Mexico. The security guard that had put them in contact with members of Los Zetas was detained for involvement in Tonio's disappearance, but later released in 2017. The man who ran the security company where Tonio worked was also detained in connection with this, with this disappearance. Police found military grade weapons and a file containing information on Tonio and on the official complaints filed by his parents. However, he was only charged with a weapons violation. The tireless work of Tonio's parents has been crucial to progress in his case. Still, more than 4,000 days after his disappearance, Tonio's family are still waiting for him to return home. I would like to thank and recognize the mother of Tonio, Senora Guadalupe Fernandez, whose communication and continued advocacy for her son's case helped shape the story map featured on our website. 
This concludes our formal presentation. We'd like to open up the floor to your questions, which can be submitted via the Q&A function. Please indicate if you are directing your question to a specific presenter, and Barb will also help to moderate the questions coming in. Thank you, Maria. And um, thank you to all our presenters. I can, um, I hope you can see why I'm so proud of this research team, um, which is just the latest group of researchers, but they've done an enormous amount of work. And I'm so grateful for their creative energy in, on this important human rights project. Um, we've received several really interesting questions to start off with. So I'm going to start with a question from Nicole Donoso, one of our distinguished alums from the University of Minnesota, but also a former coder on this project. And Nicole, it's lovely to see your name in our inbox. Um, Nicole's question is, it seems like there is a narrative that it is normal to have a loved one who has been disappeared. Who do you think is responsible for creating this normality? The state, impunity, lack of research, resources, the high number of disappearances, the society, and also how can we change this narrative? Such a great question, Nicole. Not surprising since you have some sense of what this project is about. Um, one of the, one of our findings from earlier research uh, done by Paula Cuellar and myself, it was um, to look specifically at one newspaper's coverage of, uh, of disappearances in the state of Nuevo Leon. The newspaper was called El Norte. And what we found is there was a tendency in the early years of disappearance to refer to these cases by a singular word called levanton, or to lift, the big lift, levanton. This, this terminology is strictly something that's used in Mexico. It's not used to describe disappearances in any other countries. And levanton has a very negative connotation indicating that um, the victim as well as the perpetrator were criminals, that this was a crime between criminals. And um, our, there was enormous education campaign that has happened by the families of the disappeared and organizations working with the disappeared to deconstruct this narrative of criminalization of the victims. But there was a certain sense of, um, uh, as opposed to normality, that this was an aberration. It didn't happen to normal people. And we really credit the, the campaigns of, the, of civil society of humanizing the victims, as we've tried to do today in the presentations about Israel and Tonio, to give some sense of who these victims are. Um, they're, they're real people and they're not criminals. And that, you know, as we even know from our own Minnesota narrative, if somehow people uh, had some taint of, of having done something wrong, that that shouldn't be a death sentence. Um, so uh, we find now that there's, a, I think, a greater understanding of the level of risk among the general population. Um, and because of the work of courageous journalists like Darwin and Dahlia, um, we are beginning to understand the nature of these crimes and the victims so that there continues to be pressure on the state to change the situation. Um, I don't know if anybody else has anything to add on that. Otherwise, I think I'll move to um, a next question from JT Davies. Not surprising question from JT, who is always interested in data analysis. JT wants to know, are there privacy concerns with making the database publicly available? 
how thorough are anonymization efforts for victims to mitigate the possibility of reconstructing cases from people aware of further details by other means. So I'm gonna invite Maria Ignacia to have the first response to this question. Thank you, Barb. Um, so this was a debated question uh, within our team, um, but we finally decided to use only the initials or I mean the first name and the initials of the second name, because in any case, the news articles are linked in the database. So what we were trying to do is just uh, preventing or making the job of a possible perpetrator harder to find the names. Um, and the, the, the anonymization was very thorough. We spent a lot of time uh, looking for any names in all of the questions we have in the database, in the comment section that we have. Um, and we are sure we, we are keeping the victims, the journalists, and the families uh, safer. Yeah, just to add a little bit to that, um, you know, the truth is these are public media articles. So if someone wants to click on the links, they can dig back into the press article. But we, at one point for the team, we made uh, photocopies, uh, PDFs of all the press articles, which we have in case the link disappears and we aren't able to access the article online anymore. And we have chosen to keep those PDFs confidential. So we're not making it easily accessible for people to um, uh, find coordinated material because of our research. Um, on the other hand, if there are researchers who are interested in this data and they contact us personally, and the best way to get a hold of us is at HRP for Human Rights Program, HRP at umn.edu. Um, and I'm sure Rochelle will put that in the chat. Um, the best way to, to contact us is, or if you contact us and you're interested in doing further research, um, we can make a limited amount of those, uh, those articles available in line with the research. Um, so let me go to the next question, uh, which I'll direct to Yolanda. Uh, which is, did you find different reasons why people disappeared? Was it for persecution, human trafficking, other reasons? Hmm. Um, I think, well, I'm not sure that I'm the best person to answer this question, but I think that um, we just didn't find a ton of information to explain. I don't know, maybe Barb has other opinions about this, but from my perspective, um, I think what seems like a, a nature or part of the phenomena of disappearances that is so terrifying is that it's very random and it's it feels like there's not, or not very random, but it doesn't feel like there's a rhyme or rationality to like who has disappeared. And I, I think that's a really crucial element of the terror of disappearances as a as a violent act um, on the part of cartels and a part of the government or just a phenomena. So um, we didn't have a lot of information generally on a lot of the cases, like I had mentioned, like a quarter of the cases only had one article. And so most of the time it was like a report being like this person disappeared um, with very little like follow up or information available about the outcome of the case or um, yeah information surrounding the disappearance and I'll kick it to anybody else if they have. Other yeah, I think you accurately described what we found from the press database, which indicates that there's not much explanatory information in press articles because of this this tendency to report things as as spot news or nota roja. 
So, uh, but we certainly know from other research done by the observatory and by investigative reporters um, that there, um, there are certain categories of people who are sought after um, for, um, uh, for certain professionals who might have in, uh, in, um, sorry, expertise such as engineering or medical doctors might be kidnapped and used for their expertise. And that was in line with the high number of professionals that we saw who were uh, disappeared. But we know that, that, um, young, that girls and women are, um, or young women are randomly disappeared and are used in sex trafficking. Um, we know that um, workers are disappeared uh, and migrants are disappeared to be used in various um, uh, forms of manual labor uh, and uh, criminal activities related to these macro criminal networks involving government and cartel members. And that um, often, you know, we've seen through the discovery of mass graves, um, uh, uh, the nature of um, the disposable nature of uh, the people who are disappeared and, uh, and have discussed that in, in some of the other work of the observatory about um, the logics of disappearance um, in um, related to economic activity, uh, ambiguous loss by family members as a way to terrorize um, communities and keep control of certain territory. And um, uh, because they're considered disposable, if they're poor and young uh, and don't even appear in press articles, uh, they're much less likely um, to uh, be the subject of investigations. So um, I'm going to move to another question. I see we're getting a few lovely questions. We're so grateful. Um, from Lee Payne, who is one of our great um, investigators on, on the observatory. She wants to know what we found to be the biggest surprise in terms of our research, and also to know what's next. Are we going to publish and present this research elsewhere? So I'll open the surprise question to each of you, and maybe we could get a couple responses. Rosa or Maria, did, was it, what was your surprise from uh, the, the work that you did? Um, so a lot of the work that I did was, um, I worked a lot on the story map and also kind of like writing about each of the states. So I got a lot of context about um, kind of where these disappearances are happening, but I think maybe not surprising, but the most impactful part of this project was, I guess, learning about the disappearances that were covered more in depth and seeing how drastically um, the articles that I read for the story map contrasted with articles written about less covered disappearances um, and kind of the way that press coverage works. Um, and then kind of learning about the factors that influence press coverage, especially in relation to the security of journalists that are actually working in Mexico. Um, so kind of, I guess, surprising to see which cases get covered and how that coverage is unique. Um, I guess the unique coverage of these more, the cases that get more attention. Great. Yeah, awesome. and I just say, uh, going off what Maria is saying, I definitely agree with um, all the kind of surprising uh, findings in our database. But I also think, uh, maybe not surprising, but the most impactful part of this project for me was just having the privilege um, on, while working on the story maps to see years and years and hundreds of photos of um, these families on the ground um, fighting for justice for their loved ones. Um, and I, it's very humbling to see that in the, midst, in the midst of like a landscape of such grave impunity. And so um, just, I think I felt a real sense of connection with the families and these advocates. Um, and that's something that Maria and I and the team hopes that comes through in the story maps. Um, 
because it's really uh, moving to see how despite their uncertainty of what their efforts uh, will amount to, uh, they continue seeking justice. Um, so I hope that that comes across uh, on a human level with, along with our findings. I would have to say in terms of, um, of surprising is it, it shouldn't be a surprise, but the, the smallness, the small amount of press articles in each of these four states, which have each seen thousands and thousands of disappearances was, was pretty shocking. And as much as we understand the editorial and journalistic decisions not to cover something, we find that um, the, the gravity of the day-to-day -day violence and the widespread nature of the violence seems um, so alarming that um, you would think that there would be more intense coverage. Um, I would say one other surprising thing we found is that in the state of Guerrero, which is the state where the 43 disappeared, uh, that and had huge international press coverage of the disappearances in this state, that that was the state where there was the least amount of reporting. That even in a state where that it was well known, and we know we found specifically that journalists are terrified to cover the, the disappearances there. So I suppose it's not totally surprising in the sense that a place where there could be such a huge crime um, that you, uh, you're, you're not really um, uh, eager to cover those crimes when you see the impunity in those cases. I see we have a question coming in from a Mexican journalist, no? I would love to take a look at that. Uh, Efrain writes, um, I'm a Mexican journalist covering disappearance. I was wondering what we need to improve to make better coverage of the human rights violations and um, that will be useful for people, but uh, as well as uh, this kind of analysis. What do you think, team? Um, I have initial thoughts and then Nacha, I think you might have some thoughts about this. Um, again, we think that profiling um, the humanity of the victims is very important in this work. And we have examples on our website of um, uh, different journalists who characterize that work. So there are the investigative reporters that um, were covered, uh, uh, Darwin Franco and Dalia Sousa in Jalisco, who are really extraordinary in this regard. But there are also several collectives of investigative journalists um, that we highlight on our website for a kind of profile of best practices. Um, but we, we know it, that humanizing the victims not only leads to more accountability in their cases because at, like when the families make these cases visible and won't allow their children or their loved ones to be treated as numbers, um, that it's more likely to gather public sympathy and push for government resolution in their case. Um, in terms of what would be useful for this kind of analysis, I don't think journalists should worry about that, but I do think that it's probably useful to look at our various um, factors that we consider or that we coded. Uh, so not just name and age, but as much identifying information as possible. Um, uh, about the victim, the witnesses, the perpetrators, the and then follow up. It was so um, clear to us that there is no incentive among editors and journalists to follow up on these cases. And we think that 
that could have a significant impact on the ability to gain accountability in a case. So thank you, Efrain, for that question. Nacha, do you have uh, any other thoughts about that? Um, yeah, so I was thinking about the uh, academic literature review we did. And one of the authors uh, we used for this research was uh, Elle McPherson. And she is the one that talks about this spot news reporting um, model. And the counterpart is the reported, reportage model, which I, which I think it would be uh, a good idea for, for better consistent journalism. And the, this model prioritizes articles featuring investigation and analysis. It requires a slower pace of reporting, allowing for more investigation to happen. And as a result, the reportage model uses more sources, uh, different perspectives, and a wider variety of information which, uh, with which to hold the state to account through the news. So uh, I would like to mention some of the collectives we have studied in our research, such as A Donde Van Los Desaparecidos, Quinto Elemento, Periodistas de Pie, and Sonadox, which have done a great job uh, in, in investigative journalism, basically. Thank you. So I'm gonna to switch to a question from Alejandro Baer. Um, Alejandro from the University of Minnesota asks, have we seen differences in, or identified differences in reporting about disappearances and perpetrators that's related specifically to the nature of the media outlets? So their ownership, political leaning, closeness to cartels or government groups. So I could look at Maria and Yolanda and see if you have anything to add about this, but it's a great question, Alejandro. And I think that we could probably use our database because we have those specific, um, we, you know, we have the outlets identified and then do we, in, in our database in each state, we identified the, the most, frequent uh, con media contributors of stories to our database. So the most common uh, uh, publications in those states. And um, so in each of the, of the boxes on the individual states, you can go and see who the media outlets were. So, um, we could certainly do, that's a piece of uh, analysis that we could do. And I suspect you're absolutely right. In Mexico, we see um, many of the main newspapers have um, partisan loyalties and, uh, or they're supported or they're supporting political ideologies or political parties. Uh, so uh, depending on, um, uh, who is responsible for, for these crimes, then there might be incentive for papers to, uh, uh, to do more or less reporting on disappearances. We know that there are a couple national papers uh, and news magazines uh, like, uh, like um, what's it called? Progreso, Progreso, is that the magazine? I'm having a block. Uh, that um, do more in in depth reporting, just standard um, uh, standard news reporting. Um, the certain groups, the Reforma uh, group, uh, has um, newspapers in the states. Oh, thank you, Proceso. Thank you, Paula. <laughs> it was one of those senior moments. Proceso. Uh, there are also so the Reforma group um, uh, owns El Norte in uh, Nuevo León, and we know that they uh, had uh, more independent uh, uh, journalism in Nuevo León. They were seen as more independent, but still, 
they didn't do very much reporting. And we think that as Paula and I found in previous work, there were, there were issues of security involved. Newspaper editors were being threatened, um, especially in the early years of the crisis. And there was actual um, violence carried out against the company. Um, so El Norte's headquarters in Monterrey, for instance, were subject to, um, uh, to violent um, bombings in their, in their lobbies. And uh, so there were periods of time that, that even when there were a lot of disappearances, you were not getting much reporting because of the fear. So, uh, but Alejandro, your question uh, is, a, is a good one for next steps. And why don't we end, we have three minutes left, and why don't we end with next steps, um, which Lee asked about and we should uh, respond to. Um, and we um, uh, will, we feel like this phase of the, of the, uh, of the work um, has led us to a point where we feel confident that the website will be a good interactive device uh, for the public to be able to learn about um, disappearances in Mexico and for, for researchers to be able to use the information um, uh, to uh, do their own investigation or to add to it. Um, as we worked so intensely on the website, we understood that we needed to publish this in hard copy form. So um, our goal this summer will be to take the information um, from the website and have a, uh, a PDF, a downloadable PDF with all, uh, all of the analysis. Um, uh, though it's, you know, given the reason we wanted to do a website was because of the database is a huge document and we wanted people to be able to download that in and of themselves. Um, I also wanted to mention that um, we continue to produce academic work on this um, besides Paula and my article on press, um, press reporting in, uh, in Nuevo León. The, uh, Maria Ignacy and I will be contributing to a Spanish language publication um, on, uh, that's being produced by Flaxo Mexico, our partner and we'll be writing up um, the conceptual findings of our report. And I'm certainly hoping that, that um, Yolanda and uh, Maria Ignacia also might consider uh, finding academic publications for the more quantitative analysis of the work. Um, but at this point, this closes an important chapter. We've been working on this for years. We wanted, it was a big goal for us to make this public. And we're very proud that we've been able to do that. So um, I guess in closing, I'd like to thank you all for joining us and also just uh, congratulate and thank the team for such uh, incredible work and contributions and to thank all of you who've contributed over the years to the success of this project. We certainly hope that the visibility that we bring by this primarily English language um, documentation of the problem will, along with Hunter Johnson's video, um, may build uh, continuing pressure in, um, in outside of Mexico for a resolution of this issue. And um, I encourage you all to join us on Tuesday evening um, to see Hunter's amazing work and, um, and to spread the news of the website through your own uh, uh, professional and personal networks. Thanks again to our interpreters and, um, uh, and to all of uh, the technical team that supported this. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you uh, further your comments and questions. Thanks everyone.